Hi, I'm Graham Troyer Joy. I'm a lead instructor here at Flatiron School. I'd like to tell you a little bit about why you might want to learn object oriented programming. Object orientation is a way of organizing and structuring your code. It's not in and of itself a programming language, it's a way of working within a programming language. Object-oriented programming originated at MIT in the late 50s, early 60s, so if it were a person, it would be eligible for some senior discounts at this point. The cool thing about object orientation is it continues to be used today and it continues to evolve. People are still talking about and arguing about what the best way to do object orientation is. Sandy Metz, one of the superstars of Ruby programming, just released a new edition of her book, Practical or Object-Oriented Design in Ruby, which gives both new and old developers alike a way to understand the best practices in object orientation and make the best choices in their code. What makes a language object-oriented is its ability to create what are called objects. Um, your code is organized into these objects, and those objects consist of pieces of data on the one hand and behavior on the other hand. These pieces of data are, there can be many of them or a few of them, but they're sort of like the ingredients in the recipe. The behavior is like the steps in the recipe that you go through in order to make the whole. Um, the cool thing about object orientation though is if we've got a recipe over here for potato salad, a recipe here for coleslaw, and then another recipe over here for cornbread, your potato salad recipe can tell the cornbread when to go into the oven. Objects can talk to each other and interact with each other. They can, the technical term is sending messages to each other or calling methods on each other. Each one of those objects has relationships with other objects in your code while staying separate and taking care of the things that it's concerned about. The object-oriented languages that I've worked with personally are Ruby, JavaScript, Java, which is different, uh, C-sharp, and Python. There are many, many more, and there are many arguments about what makes an ob a language object-oriented or not. All of the languages I listed implement some sort of class. A class is like a template for creating objects. So, to use a different example, let's say we have a Spice Girl class. All of the Spice Girls have certain things in common. All Spice Girls have a name. They have a spicy name, like scary or ginger or sporty. Uh, but they also have, as we said before, behavior. Spice Girls can go on tour. They can zig a zig ah. All Spice Girls have those things in common. Individual Spice Girl objects may have different names or adjectives, but they all do their behavior in the same way based on the data that they have associated with them. Because object orientation is not a language in and of itself, it's more of a structure. It can apply to a lot of languages or not at all. I'd liken it to something like a paragraph. Paragraphs can exist in a lot of different languages. They have a structure and like objects, a good one is not too long about one thing and doesn't rely on information from a lot of other paragraphs in order to make sense. There are still arguments about what makes a language object oriented or not. But some examples would be Elixir, Clojure, Rust, and Haskell. So the cool thing about this is object orientation is everywhere. Code in our lives is everywhere, and a lot of that code is object oriented. Some of it's not, but everything from native apps, every single iOS app out there contains at least a little bit of object oriented code. Object-oriented code is everywhere from airline avionics systems to medical devices to web apps to native apps. Literally everywhere code is. Since Flatiron School is a Rails shop as far as the back end is concerned, I do have to shout out a few Rails apps. Uh, Airbnb, Kickstarter, Groupon, Urban Dictionary actually, if you've ever used that. Those are all Rails apps. They use the technologies that we teach at Flatiron School in order to make their websites show up in your browser.
I think that there are a lot of different kinds of jobs that are available to someone who knows object-oriented programming. Just as object-oriented code can be applied to a lot of problems, those problems need people to work on them. So that could be anything from designing systems for avionics and airplanes, to a point of sale system for a restaurant, to an online web store, to a mobile or uh, tablet app. I think the main one that springs to mind is functional programming. So whereas object-oriented programming divides things up into objects with methods, behavior, and data, functional programming tends to chain together functions. Um, structures that are sort of actions with an input and an output. Multiple actions, each taking the output of the other, lead into a process and you get a sort of a, you can think of it as a pipe that's been welded together with a lot of different processes in it. That's the sort of basis of functional programming. I don't think there's any wrong way to learn how to code. Um, I think object-oriented code is a good starting place for many beginners because it is somewhat concrete. Objects and methods correspond to nouns and verbs that we might see in the world around us. As you develop as a programmer, you get more and more comfortable with abstractions, pure ideas that are put forth in code. Those are hard to dive into initially, an object orientation gives you a nice way to build up to those. With that said, they're not a requirement. We teach object orientation here at Flatiron from week one. I think one of the cool things about teaching students OOP is that we're actually introducing not just object-oriented programming as a specific thing, but a whole category of design patterns. It's a simple introduction to the whole concept that there are a lot of different ways to write code and some of them are better than others. Better in the sense that they will make your life easier in the future and your coworkers' lives easier and you will not paint yourself into a corner as much as you might have otherwise. The most important things that students at Flatiron learn are not Ruby, Ruby on Rails, JavaScript, and React. The most important things that students at Flatiron learn are how to debug, what to do when your program is broken and you don't know where or why, but being able to diagnose and find that problem and then fix it. But also, how to engineer a big app that has a lot of small pieces that work but also work well together. That's the skill of engineering. Finally, how to work together with other people. Writing software is never an individual sport. And in order to be effective developers, Flatiron students need to learn how to collaborate. That is a way in which you can be effective in the world 10 years from now, when we're maybe not even talking about any of those four languages, but you've been able to make a career for yourself on your skills, and you're able to learn new things as they come up in the tech community. If you're learning how to code, I think the most important thing is to just dive in. Start somewhere. I think Ruby's a great start. If you don't like Ruby, try something else. The other really important thing is to find a community that can support you, give you feedback, and give you other people to talk about code with. Helping other people is a great way to learn how to code and solidify what you've already experienced. Flatiron School has evening events at every campus, but especially here at our Access Labs campus at Dumbo. You can come right to this very classroom and code with other beginners. I think we also usually have pizza 